the last three weeks, I have been, the last two weeks, this will be the third week, an installment on teaching primarily about the furniture of the tabernacle. I have done it from the perspective that it is very important that you understand this because I believe it is impossible. For the last three weeks, I have been, the last two weeks, this will be the third week, an installment on teaching primarily about the furniture of the tabernacle. I have done it from the perspective that it is very important that you understand this because I believe it is impossible to fully appreciate who Jesus is until you understand the tabernacle. Oh, you'll know Bible stories. You know a lot of Bible stories, but you won't really know what they mean. You'll know that Jesus went to the cross and that he died for your sins, but you won't really understand the efficacious impact of his blood was a business transaction that bought you off of the slave table of sin and released you and liberated you. So you'll use terms like redeemed, but you don't really think about it. <laughs> It is only when you go into the tabernacle and you see the, the blood on the altar, the brazen altar, the price that was paid that brought about your redemption. And then you begin to consider that when Jesus went away in the cloud, he went up in the clouds through the veil into the holies of holies of which this is just a pattern. Are you following what I'm saying? The tabernacle was erected in about 1450 B.C. It is erected in the wilderness exactly one year after the Passover. So a year ago to the date, the children of Israel were slaves. And God has sent Moses down into Egypt to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. We know that. But he says, let them go that they may worship me. God is in the worship. Let my people go that they might worship me. The tabernacle, a year later, is the, the beginning of the fulfillment of what God meant by worship. God didn't necessarily mean take them out in the desert, Moses, and, and start dancing and shouting and clapping and sing joy bells ringing in my soul. He didn't necessarily mean wave your hand and sing Hosanna. Worship for him was comprehensive because the word worship means worthship. It is a Latin word, the combination of two Latin words, worthship. Show me what I'm worth. Let my people go then that they may worship me in the wilderness. Worship in God's mind isn't doing your own thing how you want to do it. God is specific about how he wants to be worshipped. And in great detail, he begins to lay down right down to the cubic inch what he wants, how it's to be built, how it's to be established, and what it's to do. You must understand that from the book of Genesis forward, all God ever wanted was to be with you. I wanted that to sink in. From the book of Genesis, from the creation, all God ever wanted was to be with you. He created the Garden of Eden so you would have a place to hang out. All he ever wanted was to dwell with you. He created you in his likeness and in his image that he might have relationship, not religion. Most people have religion, but they don't have relationship. God wants you to have a relationship with him. And he built this planet and the Garden of Eden specifically so y'all would have some hangout places. And when he came down in the garden and he looked for man, man was not in the place. He said, where are you? 
thought we had a date. And we had already run off with Satan into sin. Now, there were visitations from Genesis forward where God at different times and in sundry manners met with prophets and revealed himself. But this is the first time that we see a massive return of a meeting place from Eden to now in the tabernacle where God has set up a place for us to hang out. Somebody say a place. Literally, it, it, the term means a place of meeting. And I want you to understand in the book of Exodus, and you can jot this down, Exodus 25, verse 8. Exodus 25, verse 8. I'm going to ask Pastor to read it for me. Exodus 25, verse 8. And let them make me a sanctuary that I might dwell among them. Let them, the whole reason he wants them to build this is because this is going to be our hangout spot. This is going to be our rendezvous place. He said, I want you to build it that I may dwell amongst you. Since you can't come up. I will come down and dwell amongst you. Since your, car break down, since your car broke down, I'll come over and pick you up. Since you can't rise up into the heavenlies, we'll build a pattern of what I have for you up there, and I want to come down, and I'm going to hang out with you. Yeah. God says, build me a sanctuary that I may dwell amongst them. Now, there's another scripture that I want you to, to read over in Psalms 91. I'm just going to read the first verse and the ninth verse. The whole Psalms is amazing. But I want to read the first verse and the ninth verse of Psalms 91. This is going to help you to grow as a Christian and as a believer. If we stop coming to church as a social club and start coming to church to learn the tenets of our faith and who we are so that we are not tossed to and fro with every strange doctrine and you're not being picked out of the house of God by every person you meet in the grocery store who tells you, oh, Christianity is the white man's religion. It's a lie. It's all men's religion. Or they'll tell you, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe it. That's a lie too. So now you got good Christians talking about, I prayed to the universe. <laughs> Why would you pray to the creation when you could pray to the creator? If you read the book of Romans, you will find out quickly that the first problems that the heathens made is that they did not glorify God as God, but worship the creation rather than the creator. And now we're praying to the universe. Guess who made the universe? Are you with me? Read Psalms 91.1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He that dwelleth, he that dwelleth, he that dwelleth, he that dwelleth, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow, shadow of the Almighty. Notice there, there are two different things we're talking about. Build me a sanctuary that I, that I may dwell amongst them. But in Psalm 91, he's talking about us. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High is not enough for God to dwell if you don't dwell. It made me think of uh, John chapter 8 where it talks about abide in me and I in you. And over and over about seven times the Lord says abide, 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 abide. There are some things you get by dwelling that you don't get by visiting. You have to get beyond just visiting God when you're in trouble. Because the real benefits come from dwelling in good times, in bad times, when I'm strong, when I'm weak, when I'm right, 
when I'm wrong, when all hell is breaking loose, when nothing is happening, ordinary days, spectacular days, boring days, sick days. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying? I will dwell. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Read that ninth verse for me. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy in a habitation. Thy habitation. Because you have made the Lord your habitation and not your visitation. A thousand shall fall at thy right side, and ten thousand shall fall at thy left side, and it shall not come nigh you. That's not a promise for visitors. That's a promise for dwellers. Consistent, stable, steadfast people who dwell in the presence of the Lord. God doesn't want a one night stand with you. Stop seeing Sunday morning as your, yo, know, I, I went to church on Sunday, I paid God off. God doesn't do one night stands. He wants Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. Some of you, the blessing, you're just now starting to accrue enough interest to have power with God. You're just not having enough time invested in to see the benefit. Have you ever noticed these people that come in and they try God? And they tried him for a weekend. They tried him for three months. They, I tried it. It didn't work for me. Oh, that's why it didn't work for you. He has designed it. There's a booby trap for imposters. You have to dwell with him. You have to dwell with him. That's how he weeds out the saints from the ants. You have to dwell with him. He said, after you suffered a while, I'll establish you and make you perfect. I won't do it when you want it done. I want to see, can you praise me broke? Can you praise me sick? Can you praise me divorced? Can you praise me single? Can you praise me lonely? Can you praise me in a layoff? Can you praise me in a crisis? He that dwelleth. Secret place. In the secret place. Oh, touch everybody you can reach and tell them there's a secret place. There's a secret place. There's a secret place. The Bible said the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he shall show them his covenant. There are some things that God won't show you until you dwell. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he shall show them his covenant. The word fear is respect and honor continually. He said, if you honor me, I'll whisper in your ear. I'll tell you my secrets. I'll tell you why your mama didn't raise you. I'll tell you why you grew up with your grandma. I'll tell you why you had to move to Texas. I'll tell you why you had to go through a setback. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him and he. Oh my God, did you feel that? And he shall show them his covenant. Woo, hallelujah. Touch somebody and say, I'm going to dwell. I might be in a bad season, but I'm going to dwell. I might be going through a tough time, but I'm going to dwell. I'm not going to visit God, I'm going to dwell. If he wants to dwell with me, I want to dwell with him. Except ye abide in the vine. If ye abide in me and my word abide in you, ye shall ask what you will, and it shall be given unto you. Yep, yep. 
which brings me to where I want to be. I want to talk to you about the degrees of dwelling. And I want to illustrate it by the tabernacle. Put up my, my shot with the tabernacle. It's, 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 it's right in the middle of the 12 tribes of Israel. They're camped all around them. They're everywhere. All of them. Everywhere you look. Issachar and Dan, Nephtali, all of them gathered around on every side. You can see them all around. And the tent is the tabernacle in the midst of them. Where is the tabernacle? In the midst of them. It, it is in the midst of them. And he is dwelling amongst his people. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Now, even before the tabernacle was built, number one, they were dwelling under the cloud. Everybody, they were dwelling under the cloud. They didn't move till the cloud moved. You do realize that God brought them through the desert, but he was a cloud by day because it's hot in the desert. So he shielded them from getting the bulk of the heat. And then he turned into a pillar of fire by night because it's cold in the desert so that they didn't get too cold. Look at how God regulated your wilderness. Yes, you went through the wilderness, but he didn't let it get too much for you. He said, I'll be a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. In that sense, they were already dwelling amongst him. But then he comes closer in the tabernacle, step two, and he dwells amongst them through the tabernacle. So now God is coming closer, not in the cloud. He's on the ground. Number three, now you see a lot of, you see a lot of the tribes are still in the tent, but they're Heads of households have gone into the yard. They're coming closer. From the cloud to the tabernacle to now they're in the outer court, which I'm calling it the yard, which is country. <laughs> that has no theological value at all. But it does give you some picture of what the outer court means. They're in the yard. There are people in here right now that are in the yard. Yeah, you're in the yard, and that's okay. There is a time to be in the yard. For the last two weeks, I have been teaching in the yard. I haven't even gone inside yet. I'm in the yard. I'm in the outer court, what is called the outer court. That's where you see the brazen labor, and that's where you see the brazen altar. You see it in the yard. That's where we take care of our sin business in the yard. That's where the animals are slain, it's in the yard. That's why you see all the animals all around, because man and animals are all in the yard paying the bills. The bills of sin, the bills of iniquity, the bills of humanity, the bills of shame, they are paid through the sacrifice of innocent animals who gave their life instead of. See, redemption basically is about substitution. Adam, the day you eat of this tree, thou shalt surely die. Now when God comes down in the garden, he either has to kill Adam or find a substitute. Because if he doesn't kill Adam, then God has lied, and he cannot lie. So he goes and finds an animal and uses him as a substitute, and the animal dies in Adam's place so that Adam can live in the place of the animal. Substitution. This is the picture of Calvary. Christ died for you. So that you could live for him. It was your sins that nailed him to the tree and mine. I'm not pointing at you like I ain't done nothing, you know. Don't want lightning to hit me this morning. Glory to God. But it was your sins that put him on the cross. He didn't die as Jesus Christ. 
He died as T.D. Jakes. He died in my place so I could live in his. And I so much live in him I live, the Bible said. In him I move. In him I have my being. I so much live in his place that he said, now listen, when you go to my father, don't use your name. He, 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 he can't see you. I covered you. So whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, that will I do. Because when he saw your sins on the cross, he, I was smitten of God. I was wounded. I was bruised because I was you. You are free. You are healed. You are whole because you are me. So walk like me, talk like me, think like me, live like me. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying? Walk like me, talk like me, live like me, think like me. Hallelujah. We traded places. You remember that movie, Trading Places, years ago? That's what you did with Jesus. You traded places. You didn't just get saved because the choir could sing that Sunday. And the sister hit a high note, and you got goose pimples, and that's how come you know you say, no, you're not saved, you cold, bring a sweater. <laughs> bring a sweater, it does get a little nippy in here, bring a little sweater with you. Just because you got goose pimples doesn't mean you got Jesus. I've got goose pimples in the nightclub. What, what constitutes salvation? You come to do business at the altar. You come to cast your sins on him and ask him to place his righteousness on you. Are you following what I'm saying? Now this is what I want you to get. I want you to get this clearly. We have been in the tabernacle. We have been under the cloud. We have been in the outer court. Today, we're going under the tent. We're moving in. We're moving in with God. Now, I want you to see something before we, we move further. The closer you get to God, the smaller the crowd becomes. Everybody can gather around the outside. A few people can get in the yard, but when you get ready to go in, you got to be a priest to go in. The closer you get to God, the smaller the crowd becomes. I want to break this down into praise language. Enter into his gates with thanks and his be thankful unto him and bless his name. So when we praise him, we get into the outer court. See, anybody can praise, isn't that right? Let everything that have praise ye the so anybody breathing, you don't have to be right, you don't have to be holy, don't have to be saved, don't have to be anything. Anything that got breath, you're commanded to praise the Lord. If you believe in some other God, you're still commanded to praise the Lord. Everything that have breath, praise ye the Lord, all right? Then why did Jesus say, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth? Watch this, and the Father seeketh such. Everybody can praise, but everybody can't worship. The criteria for a worshiper goes higher than a praiser. The closer you get to God, the more intimate the expression becomes. And see, praise, praise is determined. I thank you, Lord, for my car. Thank you for my house. Thank you for my watch, Lord. Thank you for my wife. Thank you for my children. Thank you for this day. Praise is thanking God for what he did. Worship is worshiping God for who he is. It's not whether the song is fast or slow, got a beat or doesn't have a beat. It is the subject matter that determines the depth of the worship. Praise is about doing, worship is about being. 
And people who worship God for who he is say, if I don't have no car, if I don't have no job, if my marriage falls apart, if my body gets sick, I just, you are holy. Your name is holy. I worship. That's worship. Glory to God. We're going to have some fun today. I'm excited. Touch your neighbor and say, God's got you covered. Okay, God's got you covered means we're going under the tent. Now it's becoming more intimate. You have to be a priest to go under the tent. Okay. This, this is a place where the priest dwell. You can't, you can't, you can't eat in there if you're not a priest. But that's okay, because you're a royal priesthood. And a holy nation. You remember, you remember that scripture? That you should be called a peculiar people, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. So let's go in. Touch your neighbor and say, let's go in. Now when we go in, we have left the daylight. We have left the daylight and we're going into revelatory light. We're, we have left the, the, the blazing, fierce intensity of the sun and we're going in because being covered gives you three things. It gives you power, it gives you protection, and it gives you provision. It gives you power, it gives you protection, and it gives you provision. Being covered, it gives you power, it gives you protection, it gives you provision. I say this with all humility, but when my wife married me, she got power, She got protection. The brother will go off on you. A brother will go off. Don't make a brother go off. She got protection. You got my credit card? You got provision. All of that comes with being covered. Being married is a covering. But guess what? She's a covering to me too. I wouldn't have made it without her. She gave me power. She gave me provision. Thank you, Jesus. Lord knows she gave me protection. Anytime I need protection, I, I bring her with me. Sometimes she's like my third girlfriend. She, Certain things people don't say when your wife is with you. Oh, y'all gonna act like y'all. So, so being covered gives you power, it gives you protection, it gives you provision. When somebody covers you, when you stayed in your parents' house, you had power, you had protection, you had provision if they, if, if they were good parents. If they were good parents, that's, what, that, that's power. You got power. You get things done because you, you're covered. If you're covered by a ministry, you get power. You get protection. You get provision. When the priests go in, they get power. Exclusivity. The priests were a chosen group that had access to the inner sanctum that differentiated them from all other people. It set them in a category all by themselves. This power is with God and man. They had power with God and man. When the priests walked amongst men, they represented God. Oh, 
When the priests walked amongst men, they represented God. When they walked amongst God, they represented men. They had power either way. Hear ye the word of the Lord. Let me show you how much power a priest has. If the Roman soldiers would have crucified Jesus without Caiaphas nodding his head, it would have been an execution. It would have been a crucifixion, but it would have never been an offering. When Caiaphas the priest enters in to the crucifixion story, he turns Christ's execution into an offering because Christ could not be an offering without the priest. So what they meant for evil, Joseph, Where y'all at this morning? God made it good. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? From an earthly standpoint, he passes all the criteria that is necessary to be an offering. Now, the Romans say it was an execution, but God says it is an offering. From heaven's perspective, Hebrews writes about from heaven's perspective, Jesus offered up himself. He is both the offerer and the offering. Can you prove it, Pastor? Yes, I can. No man takes my life. I lay it down. And if I lay it down, I'll pick it back up again. Well, if he did that as a priest and you say, we are a priest, how do we do that? Is there any Bible for that? Yes, there is. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye what? Present your body a living what? Oh. He's talking to you like priests. He wants you to do like Jesus and offer up yourself as an offering to God. Here's my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. That's, 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 that's priestly singing. I'm offering up myself. I'm not going to make you take it from me. I'm going to give it to you. Here's my life. I offer it up to you. Touch your neighbor and say, let's go in. Let's go in. We got protection. We talked about power. We got protection. There's another layer of covering from the pillar of fire by night and day. We got protection. We're on the inside. I'm in. Somebody say, I'm in. I'm in. Glory to God. I'm in. I, I wrote a, a piece one time that said, good parents are like shade trees. You never realize how much they covered until they're cut down. The full power of who I am will not be realized until I'm dead. How many of you have deceased parents? Don't you wish you could talk to them and tell them? As long as they're standing. See, you never really realized how hot it was because you lived in my shade. When I get cut down, you say, oh my God, I didn't know. I didn't know that. I didn't know that I had to be done. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Let's see. I protected you from that. That's what it means. That's why you got to be careful who you pick. <laughs> Ladies, be careful who you pick. Because some of y'all shade trees don't have no leaves. (laughs) 
See, even when we were struggling and even when I lost my job and even when we didn't have any money and even when they were cutting off our utilities and even when I was wondering how we were going to make it from day to day and even when we were going out to pick apples to feed the kids, I was never laying in the bed. I was never comfortable. I was always going after it. I was digging every day. Even, even laying down, I had bought a lawnmower and started a grass cutting service and started cutting grass because I was determined I'm going to bring home something. It might not be fancy. It might not be pretty. It might not be mighty. I'm going to bring home something. It's your birthday. We're going out. I don't care if we have to go to McDonald's and get a hot apple pie and put a candle. I'm going to do something. I'm going to get some licks in. I'm going to fight back. You're going to know I was. Oh, don't you mess with me. You're going to know I was here. Because I am power. I am protection. I am provision. Say that I am power. I am protection. I am provision. Everybody in this room needs to say that. Everybody in this room needs to be that to somebody. You need to be somebody's power. You need to be somebody's protection. You need to be somebody's provision. Oh, God, I felt that. Made me want to go to running. That made me want to go to running. I am power. I am protection. I am provision. That means if you get me, you get an asset. If you get me, I got you. If you get me, I'm going to protect you. You'll never feel the heat because I'm going to take the heat and hold it back up off you. I am power. I am provision. And I am protection. We're going into that provision thing. Touch your neighbor and say, let's go in. When we, when we go in, when we go into the tent, we run into provision. Provision, this is the place of bread inside. No bread outside. No bread on the outside. The bread is on the inside. This is the place of bread. Provision is always first and foremost, when God starts talking about provision, he's first and foremost talking about salvation. He's not talking about big houses and fancy cars. When God says, I'm Jehovah Jireh, the primary thing is that I provide a scapegoat, a substitute, a sacrifice for your sin. I provided a price for your sin so you could sit where you're sitting right now. I paid the price so that justice couldn't execute you. I took your execution so that you could take my liberation. Do you understand what I'm saying? But secondly, it does get down into my God shall supply. All, all what? All, all my needs. God said, I will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So, so. I want to talk about this going in thing, but, but I want you to understand what we're leaving so you understand where we're going. We're going to the bread. Tell somebody, say, we're going to the bread. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Here's my cup, fill it up and make me If that's what I'm going to, what am I going from? Uh, put my graph up. I want to see my graph with the, with the, yeah, yeah, that's what I want to see. I've been out here in the yard. I was handling this sin business, this, this bloody business, this bloody business. At the labor, I washed away the guilt and the shame of it, of all of the dead works. This is a killing place. All the animals knew when they walked them in here, they wasn't going to walk back. 
This is a place of execution, of judgment, of substitution, of slaying. This is a bloody place, a smelly place, smelling of blood, the grunting of animals collapsing on the floor, throat slit, blood gashing everywhere. This is a bloody place. That's why we have the labor out here. So the priest could wash away this bloody business and get ready through a cleansing ceremony of going in. Are you following what I'm saying? This is what Hebrews 6 means when it says, read it for me, it says, Hebrews 6, 1. Uh -huh. That's all right, she wasn't ready for me. Go no, ahead. sir. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Leaving doesn't mean forsaking. It means you've completed it. Let us go on unto perfection. The problem with the church for a lot of people is we're stuck in the yard. We're either fighting about doctrine, arguing about baptism, arguing about what day of the week you worship on, arguing about whether you're really saved or not, are you pre-trip, mid-trip, post-trip, tied up in the front yard. There comes a point that you need to leave the principles of the doctrine of Christ. You need to go. The problem with the church is we're still in the yard. We're still wrestling with our sin and our guilt and our shame as if the blood were not enough to pay the price. You you're still worried about what happened when you were five, what happened when you were 10, what happened when you were 21. You're still struggling with stuff that should have been slain at the brazen altar and washed away at the brazen labor, and we need to go on to perfection. Read it again. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine uh -huh. of Christ, uh -huh. Let us go on unto perfection. Uh huh. Not well, lay. Hold it, hold it. Sit, touch your neighbor and say, let's go on let's to go on. perfection. It's time to go on. You've been mad long enough. You've been guilty long enough. You've cried long enough. You've worried about it long enough. It's time to go on. I got to get out of this yard. I got to wash this off of me. I got to get it off of me. I got to oh, shut up. Oh, I almost felt my preacher rise up. I got to get it off. 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 There's somebody in that balcony over there. You got to get it off of you. You got to get it off of you. It's been on you too long. God brought you here to bathe you, to wash you. You got to get it off of you. You got to get it off. You got to get it off. Let us go on to perfection. Read on not laying again the foundation of repentance uh -huh. from dead works and, uh, of, uh, go ahead. and of faith toward God. Not laying again the foundation of repentance. God doesn't want you to keep having to come back out here over and over and over and over and over again. Let us go on to perfection. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Let us go on to perfection. In the text, the writer is trying to encourage people to move away from the foundations and the fundamentals. Let us go on to perfection. And he warns them because he's writing the Jews that if they do not do so, you crucify the Son of Man afresh and bring him to an open shame. You understand what I'm saying? I want you to get this because this is important. This is, this is a group of Jews that had started believing on Jesus and persecuted because they had believed on Jesus. And they were starting to doubt again. And Apollo is writing to them saying that if you start, once you have believed him, once you have been a partaker of the heavenly gift and tasted the good works of God, that if you lay again the foundations of repentance, you crucify the Son of Man afresh and bring him to an open shame. He's trying to get them to hold on. Hold on, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free and be not entangled again with the yoke.
yoke of bondage. He's trying to get, don't go back up under the law. Don't go back into circumcision. Don't go back into cleansing. Don't go back into ceremony. Don't go back into worship. Don't lay the foundations again of dead works, works, works. Get away from the works. Go on into the fullness of the grace of God. Are you getting this? Are you getting this? This is important that you understand this. It's important that you know your Bible. Tell somebody and say, let's go on to perfection. We're going to go from grace to glory. We're going to go from grace to glory. We're going, we're going to another level. This is the, another level of maturity and spirituality. We're getting ready to go in the tent. We're going in. We're going in. And, and we're going to go in. I didn't know which one to pick first, but I picked the table of shoe bread. I picked the table of shoe bread, and that's where I'm going to lay my focus, and I'm going to lay my foundation for the next 15 minutes or so, and, and I'll be through. How y'all doing? Y'all doing good? Yeah. You doing good? Yeah. If you love this word, shout at me. Yeah. Yep, yep. Glory to God. Bless you, sir. Glory to God. I want to make sure I've given you everything. I missed something. That I, that, that, well, yeah, I'll do it now. Take your time, honey. When we go in, when we go into the tent, keep it right there. When we go into the tent, when we go into the tent, we've left the altar of sacrifice. We've left the labor, both of which were made out of bronze or brass. Remember that? The women's uh, looking glasses, making the labor, both of them were made out of bronze. When we go in the tent, everything is made of gold. So it does make a difference. We're moving from bronze to gold, okay? We're moving from bronze to gold. We have gone from bronze to gold. Gold is a metal that maintains its composition even through the fire. Its value will always exceed bronze. So when we go in, like Hebrews, we are going to better things. When, when you start talking about gold, when you start talking about gold, it has been through the fire. It has been through the fire. And it becomes a representative of God. It will liquefy, but it will never be anything but gold. If it was gold when it went in the fire, oh, oh they didn't hear me. Only that one sister heard what I was saying. You heard what I was saying, didn't you? If it was gold when it went in the fire, it's going to be gold when it comes out of the fire. I'm going to say that again. If it was gold when it went in, it's going to be gold when it comes out. If you were saved when you went in the fire, you're going to be saved when you come out. If you had the Holy Ghost when you went in, you will have the... Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. The Lord knows the way that I take. And when he has tried me, I shall come forth. Look at that. Look at that. You ought to get a picture of that. You ought to post it. You ought to put it on your website. You ought to put it on Instagram. You ought to put it on Facebook. And you ought to tell the devil, that's how I'm coming out. Yeah, I'm coming out. I'm coming down. I'm coming out as pure gold. The only thing you're going to do is take any impurities. That's the only thing you can burn up is impurities. You cannot burn gold. I shall come forth as pure gold. Glory to God. That's some shouting stuff right there. Glory to God. That's what you ought to say when you go in the hospital. I shall come forth as pure gold gold. That's what you ought to say when you're up under attack. I shall come forth as pure gold. If you don't know what you were when you went in, you won't know what you are when you come out. So, so the, the theme, to those of you who might not really, the, the theme of the book of Hebrews is called the book of better things. The reason it's called the book of better things is that the writer of Hebrews is comparing the old covenant with the new co covenant, and in essence, we have gone from bronze to gold. 
Okay? Yes. Now we're at the table of shoe bread. Okay, the table of shoe bread literally means the bread of presence. The bread of the presence. In the King James Version, it's called shoe bread. In a biblical or Jewish context, it refers to the cakes or loaves of bread that are laid on top of the table, shoe bread. This is the table of shoe bread. This is the table of shoe bread. And before I get to the bread, I want to make the table. Because the table has to be made. A table has to be made. Say that with me. When you get in the car and you're halfway down 408, that's going to hit you. That's what children don't know. They just come and eat. They don't know a table has to be made. A table has to be made. They don't just exist. Thou preparest. <laughs> so the table had to be made. The table had to be made, and it was made out of wood. According to Exodus 25, 23 through 24, it was made out of wood. So all the carpenters got busy sanding and fouling and shaping and spinning to make the wood. Uh -huh. It's about three feet, not a big table, by one and a half feet in, in a rectangular shape. It wasn't a big table because it had to be carried. It's important that you understand that the bread had to be mobile. Uh -huh. Yeah, and it is made out of what the King James Version calls shittim wood, which is really acacia, I didn't cuss, uh, acacia. <laughs> Gotta add a little humor into it, makes it better. Uh, acacia wood, acacia wood is a wood that, is, that grows in, in dry climates that exist in desert places. It is strong, it is resilient, it is tough. Because there's little to feed it, it naturally has a propensity to withstand the elements. It is strong, it is resistant, it is tough, but it is wood and it can be cut and it can be shaped and it can be sanded and before the table was gold, it was wood. So it was made out of wood and then overlaid with gold. <laughs> it's, it's getting down to the good stuff now. <laughs> Excuse me. This is the good stuff now, see, because we're coming into covenant. We're coming into covenant. We're coming into the strange paradoxical covenant relationship that is established in this table between the wood, a perishable substance, See, if the wood would have went through the fire, the wood would have burned up. So you're taking a perishable substance and you're marrying it to a eternal substance. So the wood represents humanity and the gold represents divinity. Oh, we're gonna dress this table out in a minute. And, and the wood would have perished, but it was covered, yeah, by the gold. And this table, this table, this table of, of wood and gold, the Shah, Itomo Shike, this table that was wood and gold, this table that was humanity and divinity is made to be mobile, is made to move, is made to move. This wood and gold, this human and divine, this man and God, this God man, this God man is made to move. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld the wonder of his glory. Are you hearing what I'm saying? We're at the table of shoe bread. We got bread moving. Somebody holler, the bread is moving. 
the bread is moving. The bread is moving. I want you to see this. The bread is moving. The, 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 the uh, my mind slipped. The, 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 the staves, thank you. The staves are the wooden sticks that were made so the priest could carry it. It was made to be carried. It was made to be carried. It was made to be carried so that they could move it when it was time to move and let it stand when it was time to stand. This is the table of shoe bread. One table, two elements. One man, two elements. He couldn't redeem me if it weren't for the wood. The wood is what made him kin to me. The wood made him kin to me. In order to be a kinsman redeemer, he had to come in a perishable form so he could be touched by the feeling of my infirmity. If he would have come all gold, it would have messed up my prayer life because he wouldn't have known what it was like to be a man, to be tired, to be weak, to be hungry, to be sleepy, to be thirsty. So he took on the form of a servant and God made a table out of wood so that he could redeem us because of wood. And yet, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God because he's overlaid with gold. This is the table of shoe bread. Oh my God. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem is the house of Oh. Bethlehem is the house of bread. Can I go deeper? Am I helping anybody? The bread was to never leave the table. The bread was to never leave the table. It, 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 is, it is stacked on the table, 12 loaves of bread, 12 round loaves of bread to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yes. To represent the 12 tribes of Israel. There we are. That's the picture I want. I went right there. It's stacked up there. God gave specifications on how everything was to be made. Even the crown around the table has symbolic value and worth. Crowned with honor and glory. It has power. The, 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 the artifacts were preserved, the plates, the cups, everything. Lord, look at that. Bless my soul. Don't that look like a communion table set up, getting ready to be served? So it is not so much that God is giving us new ideas is that God is unveiling. The word revelation, apocalypse, means apocalypse, literally means unveiling. Unveiling. As if an artist painted a picture and he unveiled it slowly. The part you saw, you didn't see it because he painted it, it was already painted. It's, you saw it because he's revealing it. What God is revealing to you is not new. Right. Well. So true. It, it was always there. Always. He's just revealing it. Yes, sir. Can I go deeper with this? Yes, now, now this is where, to me, it gets really good. It gets really good. Because this thing about bread is not new. Jesus is born in the house of bread. This thing about bread is not new. Okay. This thing about bread is not new. He is the true bread. Yes, sir. He said, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and perished. I am the true bread. I am your provision. Yes, now, the provision of God yeah. 
was so strong that when the children of Israel were going through the wilderness and they ate manna, the provision was so strong that it protected their clothes from wearing out. They went through the wilderness, 40 years in the wilderness without a new dress. 40 years and never needed a new pair of shoes. I'm going to say it again, 40 years walking in the wilderness and the soul that their shoes never wore out. I want to talk to somebody that God is sustaining. It might not look like you're getting ahead, but you ain't going down either. You might not have got out, but you never went under. I, want, I wish I had a witness. Won't God keep you in your wilderness, making a way out of no way, opening doors for you? Glory to God. Slap somebody said, that was God kept my car running, raggedy as it was. That was God. Kept my coat together when I couldn't buy a coat. That was God. Held my head together when I was about to break down. That was God. Touch your neighbor and say, look at me. I don't look like what I've been through. If I told you what I've been through, it would blow your mind. If I told you about the hell I had to face, if I told you about my wilderness, you wouldn't even believe it. Look at me. Run over and touch somebody and say, I'm still here. Yeah. Cancer didn't get me. Leukemia didn't get me. Diabetes didn't destroy me. The witch didn't hex me. The haters didn't get me. I am still here. Sit down, sit down. I got some more for you. I got some more for you. I got some more for you. Oh my God, I feel something coming in the room. It must be somebody God sustained. Have you, have you ever had somebody leave you? And they thought when they left you that you wasn't going to make it? Send them a picture. Do a selfie. Show them, because of what I've been eating, I've been sustained. You thought I couldn't make it without you, but God kept me. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. I want to talk a minute to some of you that have been diagnosed with illnesses. And by all rights, you should have been. You ought to shout this place down. Yes! You ought to shout this place down. You made the devil out to be a liar. You might be in the wilderness, but every day you are alive, God kept you. To God be the glory. Slap somebody and tell them I'm still here. Yeah. To all of you that the witch tried to hex and they crushed you and they worked all manner of evil against you and the more they crushed you, the more God blessed you. You ought to shout in this place.
The devil didn't think you'd still be standing here. The devil didn't expect you to withstand what you went through. But look at you. You got a right to praise God. If don't nobody else in here praise God, bless his high name, you got the right to give God the glory. When I think of the goodness of Jesus, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm all right right this time. (laughs) You ought to just look at somebody just go to laughing. You ought to just look at him, just go to laughing. You ought to just look at him, go to laughing. With the joy of the Lord. Look what the Lord has done. There were times I thought I wasn't going to make it. There were times I thought I was going to die. There were times I felt like throwing in the towel. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Sledge, I'm 61 years old. I've been preaching 42 years. Started out preaching at 19. Had no idea that I would survive everything I've been through. All my black hair had turned white. And I'm still standing up. Preaching the word of God with power and clarity to God be the glory. Look at you and what you've been through. You owe God the... Anybody can be great for a minute. Anybody can be strong for a moment. But to have survived years, 40 years, they've been wearing the same pair of shoes. God sustains you. There are people in this room been through all kinds of stuff. Divorces, deaths, traumas, adversities, rejection, heartache, pain, trauma, abuse, surgeries, misfortune, dysfunctional families, crisis on the right, crisis on the left, crisis over here, crisis over there, and there you standing up jumping and dancing in church, you know hell is mad, you know devils are mad. I'm going to be good this time, really, 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 I'm going to be good. Sit down. I'm going to act right. I'm going to act right. I'm going to act right. All I can say to the sinners and backsliders in this room, you ought to eat this bread. This bread will take you through stuff that you thought you'd never be able to go through. This bread will sustain you when your back is up against the wall. This bread will keep you when you don't want to be kept. This bread will make you get up out of the bed in the morning and shake yourself.
Woo. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I heard my mama and them talking. I never will forget, they were sitting in my aunt's sister's house in Marion, Alabama. She and her sisters were sitting around the table, and I would come down the hallway, I heard them talking, and they called my mama too. And, and, and my, my mother's oldest sister, uh, they called, her nickname was Sister. Our sister said to my mama, she said, Two? Where are all the old people? She said, Miss Annie Mae and them and Miss Foster Jones and all them said, where in the world are all the old people? And I was in the, coming down the hallway, I laughed to myself, I said, Lord, they don't know. They, they are the old folks. <laughs> the doggone, if I wasn't sitting up with my sister yesterday, we talked about, child, can you believe how old we are? <laughs> Ain't it shocking? <laughs> yes, sir. You blink. Just like that. You blink. Don't make fun of old people. You're going to be one tomorrow morning. I'm telling you, it's just that quick. But we stand as a testimony, young people, that you can survive. Hear me? You can't, you, you can survive. We're not here because we're perfect. We're not here because we didn't make mistakes. We're not here because we did everything right. We're not here because we dotted every I and crossed every T. But the fact that God could bring us through everything we've been through, that alone ought to make you eat your grandmama's bread, your mama's bread. I ain't changing religions. I'm gonna stick to what I got. If it brought mama. Uh. Let me get on in this bread. Just like there are two types of materials that make up the table, there are two messages to be gotten from the bread. Because the truth of the matter is, God didn't make this bread at this table. The bread at this table was made by men. And it was made by God's recipe So the making of the bread is a collaborative effort, like the making of the table is a mixture of wood and gold. God gave the recipe, but man made the bread. Okay. You must understand, this bread wasn't made because they went down to Walmart and picked up some flour. This bread had to be made by the thrashing, by the growing of wheat and then the crushing of wheat. Now y'all don't want to make homemade bread when you buy flour. These folks are in the wilderness, they don't have no dough maker. And, and here's the criteria. The bread is to be presented before God. And the criteria in the recipe, now I cook, how many people cook in the room? The criteria in the recipe is not just that it might be flour, but it must be fine flour. What's he talking? <laughs> in order to be in here, it has to be flour that has been pulverized. What's he talking? Totally crushed. There's a difference between all-purpose flour and cake flour. Cake flour is finer. If, if you know anything about cooking, you know what I'm talking about. It weighs out different. God says, make this bread from fine flour. This bread represents the 12 tribes of Israel. This bread represents people. God says, I will make bread out of you after you've crushed. Okay. 
You, you're not bred because you want a title. You're not bred because you want a position. You become bred through the crushings. You understand what I'm saying? Now you can go online and get you some credentials and call yourself a minister, but what you call yourself don't make yourself. Just because I call myself a car don't make me a Cadillac. God says in order to get in, this bread must be made of fine flour. So when God is getting ready to make you bread, I don't know who you are, but I'm enjoying you enjoying the word. He had a better time than I have over there. Crushing you. Shattering you. Breaking down your pride. Breaking down your stubborn will. Bringing you down to ashes. Making you humble yourself. Making you say yes to his will and yes to his word and yes to his way. This is fine flower. Cried all night long. Weeks of emptiness and loneliness. And God said, no, I'm not through crushing you. I want fine flour. Lord, if it be thy will, pass this bitter cup. Not till I'm finished. I want fine flour. Let me show you what fine flour is. Paul writes to Corinth to a brother who has been sleeping with his father's wife. And the Corinthian church was in trouble because his brother is having an affair with his father's wife. And Paul sends a letter of judgment condemning this brother and telling them how to handle him. And they bring him down. They humble him because he wouldn't change it. He wouldn't stop it. He wouldn't repent. Mm -hmm. But when he repented, what? he says, if a brother be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one. You're not supposed to keep your foot on nobody. I don't care what they did. You are not supposed to keep your foot on nobody because of what they did. If a brother be overtaken in a fault, overtaken means all of us got fault, but that means that fault has taken over. Then ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. You said it. Considering yourself. So that means in order to be ye which are spiritual, you have to have gone through something yourself. I don't understand how you can be so judgmental and self-righteous and you have forgotten yourself. That's why you need to be beat some more because you're still hateful and judgmental and self-righteous. But when God gets to beating your behind, you'll give mercy because you got mercy. I would rather get to heaven and hear God say you was too merciful than to get to heaven and hear God say you was too judgmental because I don't have a right to be judgmental. I did too much myself. God is beating us to find flour. Now that's who's spiritual. That's who spiritual people who have been beaten to find flour can be trusted to make judgments because they consider 
themselves. Hear ye the word of the Lord. I have not taken you through this test to destroy you. I have taken you through this test to refine you. Many shall come and eat from your wisdom because of the crushing I allowed you to suffer. Hear ye the word of the Lord. Despise me no longer. Put away your bitterness toward me. It is true I have beaten you, but I beat you to make you bread. I will draw people to you that I could not draw before because I could not trust you. But because you are now fine flour, I will draw people into your life for you to feed and not need. Shando Kosheta. Edabo Keshe. I feel the glory of God. There are many of you in here who have endured the chastening of the Lord. And God has set you on a path to make you bread. You are not in that office for the pay. You are there for bread. And God says, I will send you into places and give you opportunities because I have prepared a table and I have laid you on the table as bread. I don't know who that's for. Maybe it's you watching on the internet. Maybe it's somebody up in the balcony right there. Maybe it's somebody who's been through a painful series of crushings and loneliness and isolation and death and turmoil and you've cried and your flower has gotten salty with tears and the Lord brought you here today to make you understand he's making bread he's making bread he's making bread he's making bread there's no other way for you to know what you know there was no other way for you to have the wisdom that you had. You couldn't read this in a book. You couldn't get this on a tape. You had to go through this so that you would know that you know that you know that you know that you know that I am your God. And it says, say, So when the, when, the, when the 12 loaves were laid, on the table of shoe bread. It was from 12 tribes who had been walking a year in a desert. And they presented the bread before God. So there's, this is what I want you to see and I'm gonna stop. Mm. <laughs> 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 The thing that amazed me is that it is not just God presenting bread to us, it is that we present ourselves to him. I present myself a living sacrifice. So the first thing I want you to understand is, is you're on the table. You're on the table of the Lord. And every crushing and every breaking in your life made you eligible to be meat for the master's use. There was never to be a time that the table was to be without bread. The bread was laid up before God all week and changed out on the Sabbath. And on the Sabbath, in the incense of prayer, the bread was exchanged and the priests ate the bread in the most holy place. 
but the table was kept with bread on even when it was moving. Ooh, that's good. You better believe it. <laughs> the table was never to be without bread. Lord, don't let my table ever be without bread. Don't ever let anybody come and find me a breadless table. I don't mind getting old. That's okay. I understood that when I got here. But don't ever let my table be empty. It's yet. If I live to be a hundred, keep bread on my table. Lord, don't ever let people come to this church and find us breadless. Yes. A lot of noise and no bread. Yes. You got to know the difference between noise and bread. Yes. The church has lost its discernment. We mistake noise for bread. Just because somebody's loud doesn't mean they're anointed. Real bread feeds you. Real bread sticks to you. Real bread you'll be talking about over dinner tonight. Real bread strengthens you. Real bread stabilizes you. Real bread fortifies you. Instead of being bitter and frustrated and upset and in turmoil and angry yeah. because things didn't go the way you wanted it to be, mm. hear me good. Since God was gracious enough to bring you in here this morning, he said, you need to lay yourself up on my table and offer yourself up as bread before me and understand that the crushing blessed you. Listen. The crushing made you wiser. The crushing made you stronger. The crushing gave you discernment. The crushing turned a girl into a woman. The crushing established your going in and coming out. The crushing made a man out of a boy. You're not a man because you had a lot of birthdays. You're a man because you've been through hell and you stood up against it and kept on going. You are the loaves presented before God. And I want you to see the duality of this text. Lord have mercy. Who I'm trying to get out of it. I want you to see on one hand, the bread is offered to God. And on the other hand, it is God offering bread to us because he's saying, I will never leave your table without bread. I will always feed you. I will always make a way. I will always be your provider. I will always be your resource. I will always be your strength. I will always be your provider. All I ever wanted was to be with you. Behold, a virgin shall bring forth a child, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. Emmanuel literally means the dwell amongst us God. God said, all I ever wanted was to hang out with you. I wanted your company and I wanted your attention. I wanted you to talk to me when nobody else was in the car. I wanted you to sing before me in the morning. And I will always put bread on your table. If you worship me, I just had to all say, if you worship me, I will always, I will always make a way for you. I will always provide for you. I want to dwell amongst you. I want to be with 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 you. Leave him alone. Leave him alone. I want to be with you. I want to be with you. I want to be with you. I will always make a way. If you take me seriously, we will live together. We will stay together. I will be with you in the wilderness. 
I will be with you in the storm. I will be with you in the crisis. I will be with you in the test. I will be with you when your parents are gone. I will be with you when your children are gone. I will be with you when your friends forsake you. I will be with you when all men leave you. Lord, I am with you always. I am with you always. I am with you always. I am the Lord my God. I am the bread. Let him go, let him go. This is what happens when glory comes in a room. God breaks yokes and barriers and bondages while the word is being preached. When real word gets loose in a place, it'll drive out stuff, it'll heal stuff. People will get filled with the Holy Ghost while the word of God is being preached. The power of God, don't put too much on it. The power of God is falling. The anointing of God is here. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Where the spirit of the Lord where the spirit of the Lord is, If I had a thousand worshipers, nothing like an answer. Ah! Nothing like an answer. Nothing like an answer. Nothing like an answer. Nothing like an answer from God. Nothing like an answer from God. For a long question, years of turmoil and test, and all of a sudden you hear God speak to you. Hallelujah! The glory of the Lord is in his place. The anointing of God is here. The manna is falling down from heaven. God is feeding his people. He's feeding us in our inward parts. In our inward parts. God is feeding us in our belly. Bread of heaven. Sit down from heaven. He is to dwell amongst us, God. He is to dwell amongst us, God. Do you have any idea who dwells amongst us? Who dwells amongst us? Do you have any idea who dwells amongst us? He is to dwell amongst us, God. The bread of life. 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 The I am the mighty God. The bread of life. Why do you want the leeks and the onions of Egypt? I am the true bread. Why do you walk past me looking for somebody else to feed you? Am I not your bread? Am I not your food? Am I not your substance? Oh, shut. Here I the See, real word, real word, real word, don't need no help. No. Don't need no foolishness. No. Don't need no theatrics. Real word will walk the floor of this church and take on every devil in the house. Ah! Real word will break yokes and bondages and barriers and set the captive free. Real word will send deliverance all the way up into that balcony. It'll knock you out up under the power of the Holy Ghost. Real word will break shackles and chains off of your life. Somebody shout, yes! I don't need nothing. I don't need nothing. I don't need nothing but the word. I need 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 the word. All I need is the word. The devil is a fool. He's a fool. Think of it. Think of it. He's foolish. He's foolish. 
How dare him ask Jesus, if thou be the son of God, turn this stone to bread. Why would Jesus turn the stone to bread when Jesus is bread? You got to know who you are. If you don't know who you are, you'll mistake a rock for a dinner. You got to know who you are. Why should I seek what I already am? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm trying to stop. Thank you, Lord. The children of Israel went to sleep, and the Bible said in the morning there was bread in their tents. It fell upon the dew. The manna fell in the morning. God says, while you're sleeping, I'm making ways. While you're sleeping, I'm opening up doors. While you're sleeping, I'm revealing myself. When you wake up in the morning, the answer will be waiting on you. I don't know who I'm talking to. I don't know who I'm talking to. But when I see you lift your hands, I see manna falling down from heaven. I see bread coming into your house. I see bread coming into your heart and into your spirit. I see bread coming on your table. Oh, Shada. This is old school church. It just happened. Some of y'all don't know what to do because you used to being entertained. And if somebody don't entertain you, you don't have no power on your own. But when I get through teaching this word, you ain't gonna need nobody to sing you happy. Ain't nobody gonna have to hoop to get you happy. But something is gonna start leaping up and down inside of your belly. When I get through preaching this word, your soul is gonna catch on fire. Right now, you're getting a contact high. But before it's over, you're going to learn how to draw all the glory when it starts falling down. Whosoever will, let them come. This is the sound of a church. This is what church sounds like. All praise and honor to God, to the Lamb that was slain from the foundations of the world. All praise and all honor to God. This ain't about your dress. This ain't about your hat. This ain't about your stilettos. All praise and honor to God. All praise and honor to God of praise and honor. Give it to him. Put your bread on the table. Put your bread on the table. Put your bread. Here come the Here come the 